To kick things off, I need to mention that I'm sharing this from a hospital room. Just yesterday morning, around 7.30 a.m., my wife and I found ourselves in a car accident. I walked away with only a few scrapes and bruises, but Sarah, my wife, sustained some serious injuries. A crushed shoulder, a broken collarbone, three fractured ribs, and a collapsed lung. The doctors say she'll recover completely, but for now, they've got her heavily sedated. If everything had been perfect in our marriage, I wouldn't be sharing this with you, that much is clear. I never imagined that Sarah could betray me in any way. My heart feels shattered, and I'm left feeling incomplete, like a vital part of me has been ripped away. The worst part is that the missing piece is just three feet away from me, lying in that hospital bed. Over the past three months, I sensed we were drifting apart, but I couldn't pinpoint why. At 34, Sarah and I have known each other since childhood. We started dating in high school and stayed together throughout college. She's the only woman I've ever been with physically, and until recently, she could say the same about me. We tied the knot a year after graduating and welcomed our first child, David, just a year later. Three years after David arrived, our daughter, Olivia, entered the picture. I cherish my kids more than anything in the world. If it weren't for them, I honestly don't know if I'd be holding it together right now. Thankfully, they weren't in the car during the accident. They were at my parents' place for the night. We were supposed to fly to Florida for a cruise yesterday afternoon, but obviously, those plans are now out the window. Sarah decided to go out with her best friend, Rebecca, despite my pleas for her to come home and stay off the roads in the snow. She insisted they were only going to grab a few drinks since they wouldn't see each other for a week. I went to bed and slept soundly until around 5 a.m. When I finally got up and peeked outside, I noticed Sarah's car was still missing, and the snow had piled up even more. I figured Sarah and Rebecca had likely gotten a bit too tipsy and stayed over at her place. I quickly threw on some clothes and jumped into my SUV. Before hitting the road, I shot Sarah a text warning her against driving because the snow was getting too deep and that I was on my way to pick her up. That message went unread. Countless times, I found myself wondering what might have happened if she had actually seen that text. I'd still be stuck in a lie, clinging to a gut feeling that something was off, but I wouldn't be drowning in the unbearable misery I feel right now. When I pulled up in front of Rebecca's condo, I glanced at my phone again. Still no sign that my message had been read. I held on to hope that Sarah would see it and be ready by the time I arrived. But deep down, I braced myself for the reality that I'd need to go in and wake her up. The front door was wide open, so I stepped inside and glanced toward the TV room on my right. No one was passed out on the couch. Knowing Rebecca's bedroom was downstairs and not wanting to disturb her, I decided to head upstairs to the guest room and open the door. That's when my life changed forever. Walking into that room, I saw two heads peeking out from under the covers. I remember leaning down to pull the comforter away, and in that moment, I spotted my wife, Sarah, resting her head on some guy's bare chest. The next thing I knew, I was wrestling with Rebecca, Sarah, and this shirtless stranger as they tried to pull me off him. Honestly, I'd probably be in jail right now if they hadn't intervened, but I don't really recall much about it. So whether it was right or wrong, I don't feel particularly guilty about my reaction. As for my wife, well, her mood seems to shift by the minute these days. When I finally regained my composure, the guy mentioned he'd take his buddy to the hospital. Meanwhile, Sarah was sobbing uncontrollably while Rebecca and I screamed at one another. I told them both that I was leaving and that Sarah had five minutes to get in the car or she could forget about coming home. She managed to be ready in just three. Driving in the snow while angry was a terrible idea, even with four-wheel drive. But it was another vehicle that swerved into our lane, sending us crashing through a guardrail. That's what caused Sarah's injuries. The car flipped over, but thank God for airbags. We survived. The kids don't even know about the accident. I haven't contacted anyone, and I probably should have, but this isn't just a car wreck. 
My entire life feels wrecked, and I'm trying to assess the damage before dragging anyone else into this mess. I'm numb, yet it hurts like hell, and it's not from the accident. I feel like I don't even recognize the person lying in that hospital bed anymore. There are so many questions I want to ask her, but deep down, I'm terrified of the answers. It's clear she no longer loves me. No one with any decency could betray someone they claim to love. So, I find myself questioning whether she ever truly loved me in the first place. And now that she's crossed that line, would I even want her to love me again if there was any chance of that happening? I'm not sure exactly when Sarah first strayed, but in my eyes, the moment she did, our marriage came to an end. She broke our vows, and by doing so, she ended our union. I don't need a divorce lawyer to dissolve our marriage. She's already taken care of that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm no longer bound by the promises I made. A massive part of me wants to just walk out of this room right now. I want to call her parents, tell them everything she's done, and let them know she's their problem once again. After all these years together, we promised to stick it out for better or for worse, and I genuinely meant that. But now, we're no longer married. A part of me even thinks about leaving her a note that says, too bad the worst happened after you decided to end our relationship. The only thing keeping me anchored in this awful room is my kids. I long to see them, but I've got some scratches on my face and neck that would give away something's wrong if they noticed. As much as I feel my wife has tarnished our family, my children still need her. I thought I had a lifelong partner, and despite how terrible she's turned out to be, my kids deserve a mother in their lives. There are conversations I'm not equipped to handle, and I wouldn't even know where to start. There will be injuries that require comforting kisses instead of being told to toughen up. I pride myself on being a great father, but I can't play the role of a mother, too. Please, I need help. How can I sit here and look at someone who has stabbed me in the back so brutally? Should I call her parents to come? What on earth do I tell them? I really don't want to face them, especially since they'll see I'm seething. If I don't disclose what she did, they're bound to sense my anger. And what in the world do I say to my kids? Sure, I can tell them we had an accident, but I'm not one to fake emotions. Obviously, my wife seems to have that skill down. But when I'm filled with rage, it shows on my face. They'll know I'm upset with their mother. How did my life spiral into this mess? I already know I need to consult a lawyer, that much is clear. But how do I even begin to deal with all of this? That day, I decided to stay one more night in that hospital room with Sarah sedated and the lights dimmed. I reclined in the chair, staring up at the ceiling while listening to the beeping of the medical machines. I lay there, grappling with how my life had plummeted to this point. Part of me felt I was giving her undeserved mercy just by being in the same room. Yet I still felt a flicker of love for her. I didn't want to feel that love. I felt weak for holding on to any positive feelings toward her. Over and over, it struck me that there was no way to revert things back to how they used to be. It was like a natural disaster had swept through, destroying the life we built together. I cried, so hard that it felt like my heart was breaking. I understood that a significant chapter of my life had come to an end. That realization was monumental. The next morning, when the nurse came in to draw blood, I took that as my cue to step out. As I was leaving, Sarah woke up and called out to me, but I pretended not to hear her. I headed down to grab some breakfast. Ever since finding out the truth, my appetite has been nearly non-existent. I tried to pass the time by eating and scrolling through my phone. There was a text from Rebecca asking where Sarah was, but I left it unread. By 7 a.m., the light was bright enough for me to knock on Sarah's parents' door. Her dad has always been an early riser, so I figured I'd talk to him first, and if he thought his wife needed to know, he could wake her. I noticed smoke rising from the wood stove in his workshop out back, so I knocked on the door before stepping in. When he saw the scratches on my neck and the bruise on my cheek, I explained that there had been an accident and that Sarah had suffered the worst of it, but we needed to have a serious talk. 
I think he assumed I was going to discuss the accident, so he called my mother-in-law to join us. We settled in the kitchen while I recounted how, rounding a curve, a car coming towards us veered into our lane. With our heavier vehicle and all-wheel drive, I managed to keep us on the road until we crashed into the guardrail. The passenger side door hit one of the concrete vertical beams, and even with the side airbags deployed, Sarah took a hard hit. I explained that she had a lot of injuries, but assured them she was stable and expected to recover fully. They both shed tears, feeling relieved that their daughter would still be around for them to love. As soon as they suggested they would do anything to help care for Sarah, I cut them off, clarifying that the wreck wasn't why I was there. They looked bewildered as I explained how I had sent a text that morning, intending to check on Sarah in the snow. Then, I shared the horrifying experience of walking in on their daughter with a man I'd never seen before, and my instinctive reaction to physically confront him. They were taken aback, clearly shocked. I then informed them which room Sarah was in at the hospital and expressed my desire for them to remain involved in the kids' lives, hoping we could still keep a friendly relationship. I mentioned that my dad was looking after the kids for now, but I was in the process of divorcing their daughter since she had shattered our vows and was no longer my wife. I explained that I was leaving their place to head to my dad's and that I would be telling the kids about the wreck. I also planned to let them know that we were splitting up and that their mother was a cheater. I told my former in-laws that while it pained me to see things end this way, at least I could take comfort in the fact that I wasn't the one who wrecked our marriage and my life. They tried to convince me not to be so rash, arguing that Sarah had made a mistake and offering the usual lame excuses. I simply smiled and told them I had genuinely enjoyed having them as in-laws over the years, then walked out. When I arrived at my dad's house, I had so much on my mind that I needed to unload. I walked in through the kitchen and found him sipping his morning coffee. The only thing he knew was that I was supposed to be off enjoying a big boat in the Caribbean. He stood up, looking puzzled, and asked what I was doing there. I just wrapped my arms around him and broke down, crying like a child. He could sense I needed to vent but also realized he had to let me cry it out before asking too many questions. He led me into the den and sat me down on the couch, saying he would go fetch my mom. We both encouraged her to grab a cup of coffee first, but she knew if I was there alone that early, it must have been something serious. I started by telling them about Sarah's infidelity, how I caught her in the act, and my subsequent departure from Rebecca's place. Then I explained the wreck and how bad it was, detailing Sarah's injuries and mentioning that I'd just informed her parents about it an hour earlier so they could visit her. Both of my parents were left in shock. My mom finally asked what my plans were moving forward. They cried as I explained that my only remaining option was to divorce Sarah and focus on being the best father I could for my kids. As our conversation started winding down, I heard my daughter, Olivia, squealing, Daddy, and racing down the stairs towards me. That woke my son, David, who was also down in no time. I hadn't seen them in ages, so I spent precious moments hugging them, grateful to be with them again. It took them a while to notice my scratches, and I explained about the wreck and reassured them that their mommy was in the hospital but would be okay. I mentioned that Sarah's parents would eventually pick them up to take them to see her, and that was all I felt I needed to share. I spent the day playing with, talking to, holding, napping alongside, and laughing with my kids. They reignited my will to live. Up until that moment, I was honestly about 50 to 50 on whether I wanted to carry on, but they made it clear that they were worth living for, protecting, and cherishing. Sarah's phone had been wrecked in the accident, so no one had received any responses for days. That evening, I started getting texts from my mother-in-law's phone, which I knew had to be coming from Sarah. I ignored them. The messages continued sporadically throughout the night, so I turned off notifications to avoid the distractions. The next day, I reached out to three law offices about filing for divorce. I can't say I want or even need a legal divorce, but it's necessary to divide our assets and sort out custody of our children. What she does with whom is no longer my concern. I met with two lawyers, and I was quite impressed with the second one. 
I'll check in with the third-rated lawyer to see if they can win me over. If not, I'll go with the second firm's top divorce attorney. Regardless, I'll have eliminated three top legal options from her list, and that feels like a victory to me. Custody is my top priority. I'm not aiming for full custody, nor would I want it if I could. My kids need their mother in their lives, but because of her actions, she can never again be part of mine. A go-between can handle dropping the kids off whenever they need to be somewhere. There's no reason for me to ever speak to her again. I obviously never truly knew her, so why would I continue interacting with a stranger? I'll be back at work next week, which would have been our cruise week. I didn't share with anyone at work that we didn't go or anything about the wreck. Of course, people will see me driving a rental car and question whether I got a new vehicle. I'm not sure if I need to inform HR, but I'd rather keep my personal life private. I feel humiliated as it is without it becoming gossip. Divorce might sometimes be necessary, but it always signifies failure. Yet I'm done being the anchor for a ship that has already sunk. For those who insisted, rightly so, that I get tested for STDs, I went through a full screening. Thank God it came back clean on all counts. Even so, the experience made me feel like some kind of trench coat pervert, despite having done nothing wrong. By now, I assume Sarah has left the hospital. Her parents didn't even bother to bring her home. They wouldn't have been able to contact me anyway because of the constant texts from Sarah that I wasn't reading. As soon as I can file for divorce and have her served, I'll finally be free from the biggest mistake of my life. Her actions have invalidated all those years we spent together. If I had the chance to do it all over again, I wouldn't choose her. I'd pick a life with someone else, anyone who could be faithful and loyal. The greatest thing Sarah had is what she willingly threw away, the trust that comes with having someone to call your own. Now, she's left with nothing but loneliness. I know it was all a lie. I meant nothing to her. People often get swept away by a beautiful lie while recoiling from the ugly truth. I'm not one of those people. Unless someone is holding a gun to your head, there's no justification for cheating. Once you've made a life commitment that you swore to uphold, choosing to destroy it for the other person is downright vile. I wish to God I had never met her and had taken a chance on someone, anyone else. She had no right to create a life for me and then take it all away without my consent. The man I was before her betrayal is gone for good. The woman she pretended to be never truly existed. And the life I had is now a crumbling facade that no one wants to inhabit. Not only am I uncertain about where to begin, but I also don't even know what to say when I finally do. The first thing I want to share is that I managed to find a really good lawyer. Her firm has the highest ratings for representing men in divorce cases in my area. Instead of handing my case off to someone else in the office, she took it on herself. Everyone at the firm has been kind and supportive. I can tell they genuinely care about more than just collecting their retainer and a paycheck. Sophia, my lawyer, has gone out of her way to help me with my well-being and sanity. Once she agreed to take on my case, we went through the usual forms I needed to fill out. I provided information about our property and all our bank accounts, along with rough estimates of our incomes. After explaining the wreck and what I saw just before it happened, she asked if I had undergone an STD panel. I told her I had and that everything came back clean. Then she inquired if I had documented the infidelity with any photos or videos. I had to admit that I hadn't been thinking clearly enough at the time to do that. She called a private investigator her firm frequently uses and set up a meeting for us the next day. Since I live in an at-fault state, I knew I needed solid evidence to support my divorce claim, even though I was already aware of Sarah's unfaithfulness. We arranged for one of her staff to act as a go-between for me and Sarah's dad regarding communication and to coordinate drop-offs. I had her aide notify my soon-to-be ex-father-in-law that my ex could have the kids that upcoming weekend and the following week. Sophia then asked if I had set up therapy for myself and the kids. I explained that I had my first therapy appointment scheduled for that week, but since the children hadn't been informed about anything yet, I was holding off on that. 
She told me to let her know as soon as I felt they needed professional help. She had several therapists she could recommend. She expressed what seemed to be sincere sympathy for everything I was going through and would continue to face. I generally dislike lawyers, but I think I might have found one with an actual soul. She provided me with a list of things to gather and tasks to complete before our next meeting. Many of her instructions were similar to what I'd seen online, so when she suggested I swing by the drugstore to pick up two DNA kits, I didn't think much of it. I understood it was standard protocol. That night, when I got home with the kids, I did the cheek swabs for all of us. I sealed everything up and mailed the kids off after dropping the kids at school the next morning. Two days later, on Friday, the go-between dropped the kids off with their grandfather for the weekend. That morning, I headed to work. I had just returned from lunch when I received an email notification in my personal account. I noticed it contained two emails from the lab, so I decided to wait until I got to my desk to check them out. I opened the first email and clicked on the link. The results confirmed that my son, David, is indeed my biological child. I opened the second email and clicked the link, reading what it said. I read it again, trying to comprehend the words. I was at a loss for words and could only shake my head in disbelief. I knew I needed to leave the office before I broke down, but I managed to take screenshots of both results and emailed them to myself as photo files. Once I got to my car, I began to sob uncontrollably as the harsh reality sank in that my daughter, Olivia, was not actually mine. I can't imagine losing an arm would hurt more than losing a daughter. It felt like my very soul was being ripped away from me. There's no other way to put it. I didn't know who to call. I sat there crying, wishing more than anything that I could wake up from this nightmare. I downloaded the files from my email and texted the pictures to my lawyer. Within 20 seconds, Sophia called, asking where I was. Work was all I could manage to reply. She insisted I stay put, assuring me that someone from the firm would arrive shortly. I ended the call, opened the door, and suddenly found myself vomiting uncontrollably until I was dry heaving. By the time I got a handle on it and stopped feeling dizzy, one of the paralegals had shown up to take me to the firm. As soon as Sophia finished with a client, they ushered me into her office. The first thing she said was that sometimes test results can be inaccurate. She acknowledged that I had every right to be upset, but urged me to get both Olivia and me tested again at a local lab to ensure nothing got contaminated. I couldn't wrap my head around what was happening. Even after catching Sarah cheating, I assumed that the DNA test for the kids was just a formality. I never imagined my wife could have been unfaithful enough to have someone else's child. For that was true. Who the hell did I even marry? I didn't have concrete proof yet, so confronting Sarah was out of the question. I couldn't fathom how we'd even have that discussion if the results confirmed our worst fears. One of the women at the firm checked my blood pressure with a cuff to make sure it wasn't dangerously high. It was elevated, and I felt like I was on the verge of a panic attack. Yet, I was numb and in shock all at once. I wondered what lay ahead. The thought that my little girl might have never actually been mine was too much to bear. At that moment, I was grateful the kids were with their mom. But then doubts crept in. What if both tests were wrong? What if David wasn't my son, either? I knew I couldn't wait two days for answers. So the go-between arranged to pick up Olivia the following day for a few hours to take her back to Sarah's parents. We did the test in a sterile environment, handled by trained medical professionals. There was no chance for mix-ups. I am not Olivia's father. It still took a day to get the results, and by the time I received them, she was back with her mom. When I read the news, I cried even harder the second time. I was relieved Olivia wasn't there to witness my breakdown. I sent the results to my lawyer, and she called to check on me. She encouraged me to reach out to family and not face this alone. I got into my car and drove to my dad's house, sobbing the entire way. When I arrived, my mom could see something was wrong but couldn't get me to open up. 
Finally, I managed to say, Olivia is not my daughter. My mom asked, what? But deep down, she knew she heard me right, and I couldn't repeat it. After about 30 seconds of silence, aside from my weeping, she stood up and grabbed her cell phone. She called my dad, telling him to hurry home but to be careful because I had bad news. I could tell my dad wanted a hint about what could be so devastating, but my mom insisted he just drive safely and get home as soon as he could. He made it back in about 20 minutes, and we all just cried together for hours. I'd console my dad, he'd console my mom, and we were all inconsolable. They, of course, asked about David, and I reassured them that he was mine. They both felt relieved but then expressed guilt for feeling that way about only losing one grandchild. They asked me what my plans were, and I told them I had no idea. The only thing I was certain of was that Olivia would never lack for anything she needed or even most things she wanted. I didn't care about potential child support right then, I just wanted to ensure she would be taken care of. As awful as I felt for myself, I felt even worse for Olivia. She was completely innocent in all this. Did I want custody of her? Was that even possible? I started to wonder if Sarah knew or suspected anything. Suddenly, I was desperate for answers. I met with Sophia after work on Monday, and she informed me that she had spoken with the private investigator hired to follow Sarah. Because of the wreck, Sarah hadn't been able to go out and cheat anymore, so I wasn't surprised that the investigator didn't have any recent evidence. However, one of the things Sophia asked me to bring was Sarah's old cell phone, which I had dug out of a drawer at home. The investigator was able to access nearly every app on it as if he were using her destroyed phone. He found nude photos sent and received from various guys, a mountain of messages, and enough sexting admissions to sway any judge. When I was asked if I wanted to see any of the pictures or read the texts, I declined. Sophia and I needed to strategize how I would confront Sarah about Olivia. She thought it would be best to do it in her office if Sarah could be convinced to come. Sophia called Sarah's mom's cell while I was there. Hearing Sarah's voice for the first time since I left the hospital was surreal. Sophia got straight to the point, telling her that she needed to meet with me to discuss a few important matters. My ex quickly declared that she had been wanting to talk. When asked if her lawyer could be contacted, Sarah claimed she didn't have one but agreed to come the following afternoon to meet. Took everything I had to get through that conversation. The next day, I went to work, desperately trying to keep it together and appear productive. I struggled to keep my lunch down and left at 3 p.m., feeling nauseous as I headed to the firm. I arrived first on purpose, wanting her to walk in and have to sit away from the door, unable to approach me. I was scrolling through pictures of our so-called perfect family when she finally walked in. She needed help walking and was still in two casts from the accident. I didn't have to worry about her trying to hug me. Part of me thought she might be playing it up for sympathy, but I reminded myself we had just been in a terrible wreck. I just wanted her to sit down so I could finally ask her to explain herself. Once we were all seated, water was offered, and the meeting commenced. Sophia started by asking Sarah if she was okay with us recording the session. Sarah agreed. As soon as the recording started, my soon-to-be ex-wife attempted to apologize. I cut her off bluntly, point-blank asking her how many men she had cheated on me with and when it had started. There were enough confirmed hookups from the investigator to know that the guy I caught her with was far from the first. Of course, Sarah had no idea what we knew, and I guessed her plan was to minimize the severity of her actions by only admitting to what she thought we already knew. I pressed her again, asking for a rough estimate of how many men she had slept with since David was born. Giving that specific time frame seemed to cause her to pause for a moment, but she continued to act clueless. She still thought it was a game at that point, and I could feel my temper rising. Sophia gently placed her hand on my shoulder and pushed me back from the table. She then asked Sarah if I was a good father. Sarah quickly praised me, saying she couldn't have asked for a better dad for her children. The way she said her children made me want to stand up and flip the table over. 
Sophia then asked her if the father of her other child would be a good dad, too. As Sarah began to question which other father I was talking about, my lawyer slid the paternity results for Olivia across the table. As much as I hated what my life had become since discovering her infidelity, I needed to witness her reaction in person. She was obviously shocked to find out Olivia wasn't mine, and tried to hit me with the you're the father who has raised her line, but I had to shut that down. I asked her who Olivia's father was. She looked down, her face hinting at shame, and said she didn't know for sure who he was. That's when Sarah saw me break down into tears for the first time. I just couldn't hold it together any longer and lost it. Sarah was crying, too, but she asked if she could explain. She reminded me of the postpartum depression she went through after David was born. I did my best to be sympathetic in that moment. I can say with certainty that I spent every available moment caring for my son, so she could have some time to herself. There were days when she was so depressed that she couldn't even get out of bed, and I took care of everything, but I loved doing it. I loved it for the family I thought I had. I even remembered feeling foolish enough to think that surviving that period had made our relationship stronger. I hoped she wouldn't place the blame on Rebecca. When Sarah first got married, she would go out for girls' nights, and I was relieved, even grateful. They'd been best friends for years, but hadn't spent much time together during her pregnancy. Sarah confessed that she got really drunk on one of those nights and let some guy feel her up while she gave him oral sex. She claimed she felt guilty about it for a while, months in fact, but then she started to resent not being able to enjoy her youth and freedom to be with whoever she wanted. She revealed that she began hooking up with guys during the nights she would go out with Rebecca. Until the night before the wreck, she had always come home, albeit single. 